Thank you, Emily. As Emily mentioned today, body parts, pharmaceutical drugs, food, and more can be printed in a matter of hours with 3D printing technology. While additive manufacturing is cost-effective and waste-reducing, it presents significant legal challenges ranging from intellectual property, tort liability, and uh, regulatory issues. And today, we will address many of those concerns through our panels and presentations. The symposium features experts from all over the nation and fascinating discussions about 3D printing. So we hope you enjoy the program. And I would now like to welcome our first speaker, uh, Mr. Michael McAlpine. Michael McAlpine is the Benjamin Mayhew Associate Professor of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Minnesota. His research focuses on the 3D printing of functional materials, including electronic and biological materials, and the interweaving of these objects. He has received a number of awards for this work, including the NIH New Innovator Award, the DARPA Young Faculty Award, among others. Today, he will be discussing what 3D printing is and what its capabilities are, and will present on his current work in 3D printed bionic nanomaterials. Please give him a warm welcome. All right, everyone, uh, thanks for having me here today um, to talk about the research that we're doing here at the University of Minnesota related to 3D printing. And um, what we're doing is a little bit different than what a traditional 3D printer can do. So I think this will hopefully be eye-opening to uh, several of you. And I've tried, tried to make the talk fairly broad, so uh, if you're a scientist, you'll understand. And if you're not, you, hope, uh, you will as well. So um, what we're trying to do here is uh, I'm going to explain in a bit exactly what 3D printing is. And I'm sure you've heard about it in the news. but. Uh, usually most commercial 3D printers that you buy, they, they're ways of basically printing a hard plastic object into a shape that you design on a computer. That's really what it comes down to. I'll show you a picture of that in a second. But um, every commercial 3D printer that you buy can print a hard plastic, is focused on printing hard plastic objects. And the reason why 3D printing hasn't really taken off uh, in the home use that much is because uh, how often are you going to need to print a hard plastic object, really? So people have been using it to print maybe toys or little figurines for your children or whatnot, but it's not clear exactly yet what the killer application is. So we, what we're trying to do is actually expand it and broaden it beyond hard plastics into uh, a, a range of functional materials. And that it can include biological materials, electronic materials, the merger of these two together, and uh, biomedical devices and that sort of thing. So to kind of explain our research group, uh, the, 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 the general theme, uh, what we're interested in in terms of the, the bigger picture is we're interested in bionics. So uh, if you think of bionics, you know, you've probably read in the news things like Google's uh, robots that they're developing, which behave more and more like humans. Well, you can look at this from another perspective, too. You can see if you can uh, make humans more and more like robots by basically interfacing electronic devices onto the body in a, in a seamless way. And uh, this is happening. I mean, many of you here are probably wearing uh, smart watches, which are basically electronic devices that are tethered uh, to your wrist. But what if you could integrate that in a more seamless way on the body? A kind of classic example of this would be the cochlear implant, where someone loses their hearing completely, and then you have this electronic device that's kind of mounted on the skull and fed through the tissue of the cochlea in order to basically restore hearing again from someone who's lost it completely. Of course, that's an extreme example, but this is extreme measures, uh, but what if you could uh, make this mounted electronics more seamless so it just kind of blends into the body uh, in a seamless way for a variety of applications. This could be human machine interfaces, augmented capabilities, regenerative biomedicine, and uh, smart prosthetics and things like that. So as a materials engineer, which is what I am, you have to think about it and uh, what, what is the reason why we can't take electronics and merge it in a seamless way on the body? Even the smartwatch is basically a brick that you strap onto your wrist. What is preventing us from kind of a, a seamless merger of electronics on the body? And there's actually three things that I can think of. The first is that if you look at your laptop, you look at your cell phone, uh, you look at the smartwatch, you look at the chip that underlies it, which is the image that I show there, they're all two-dimensional, flat, rigid, hard, brittle objects. Whereas biology is three-dimensional, soft, flexible, stretchable, you have a mismatch in the dimensionality and the mechanics. 
And also, you need high temperatures to process these uh, chips, which are way higher than what biology can withstand. So the question is, uh, so you have serious materials mismatches between electronic materials and biological materials. Biology is soft. Uh, electronics are hard. If you drop your computer, you drop the smartwatch, it's going to shatter. If you drop an organ, it's not going to shatter. It's going to bounce, basically. So you have some, uh, some serious mismatches here that make it very difficult from a materials perspective to make this merger very seam in a, uh, happen in a seamless way. So that's what attracts me because um, it, there's some not just bigger challenges here in terms of bionics, but also basic materials challenges that we'd like to overcome to do that. So it's really actually a fairly rich problem, both at the kind of basic scientific level and uh, in terms of solving these major next generation challenges, which is everyone's going to be a cyborg. So, so what exactly is 3D printing? So um, if you know about it, you've probably seen in the news, maybe you know a lot about it, maybe you know a little bit about it. But really, at its very basic level, if you go buy a commercial 3D printer right now, what it is is you have your computer and you have the printer. And you draw something three-dimensional on your computer, like in this case, uh, this head here. And then the printer will go and print a plastic version of that. And the way it does that is you have some polymer come in, it gets melted, and it's, the printer spits it out, and then it spits it out layer by layer. So you have control over the X and the Y and the Z direction as it builds this thing up layer by layer. And that's why it's called a 3D printer. You have th three-dimensional control there. And uh, this typically involves heating, as I mentioned, and it typically involves making hard plastic objects in the end, as you can see here, like this, like this head. So you design it, a three-dimensional object computer, and then you end up with a hard plastic version of that uh, from the printer. And as Nia mentioned, this happens over the course of um, uh, a few hours. Okay, So it's not super fast, actually. It's not something that's really that great for mass manufacturing because you're doing things in a serial way. You're drawing line by line, layer by layer. It's not like a mold where you just create it in one step. So from a manufacturing standpoint, it's actually not the most efficient technique that there is. But there's still some advantages to it compared to um, traditional manufacturing approaches. And I'll explain what those are as we go along here. Now for us, what we'd like to do is we like to expand this beyond hard plastics, which are limited in terms of what they can do, to the broad spectrum of materials properties that are around us, electronics, bi biologics. And this can really impact lots of different areas going forward, as we think. There's some of the kind of uh, if you're not a scientist, these words may seem, uh, uh, these are the kind of buzzwords that scientists throw around here. But um, in the background here, what you see is a 3D printer that we built ourselves. Because in order to be able to handle lots of different materials, uh, you can't buy a commercial printer to do it. We have to build everything ourselves. That's the advantage of being in a mechanical engineering department. Students know how to build these things. Now, if we go back to the original challenge here, how does 3D printing solve these issues? Well, first of all, you're printing in three dimensions. So you're printing in a dimensionality that is naturally a good fit for biology. Uh, second thing is you can take functional materials and feed it into the printer and print them out at room temperature, actually. So we can make materials at high temperature, then do a room temperature deposit from the 3D printer. OK, we, we don't use that much heating in our case because we're not doing hard plastic. So we do everything at room temperature and basically spit out functional materials but we can spit out functional materials and soft materials together and mix them together in three-dimensional constructs. And that's how we kind of get this seamless interweaving or merger of, of materials properties. And that's how we overcome the dichotomies that are laid out in this slide here. And again, in order to do that, we have to build our own printers. This is our second generation printer here. We're now on our third generation printer. It's in the lab doing amazing things. Um, so maybe I'll talk about it in future years. But all right, so from a manufacturing standpoint, I already mentioned it's not the most efficient uh, tool. So what are some advantages of 3D printing? What are kind of the niche applications uh, where, it, where it does have some advantages if throughput is not the advantage? So a couple of things. First is you get customization. So you can, for example, scan something, get that geometry like the head you saw before. Maybe you can scan someone's head and get that design in the computer and then print something that's an exact replica of that. You don't have to go through the process of making a mold. And let's say you wanted to make, uh, let's say you wanted to, you had a uh, shop where someone comes in and you scan their head and then you print it out and they, they take it home and show their friends. So uh, in that case, you don't want a mold, right? You don't want something that you're going to mass manufacture because everyone has a different head. 
So, so the 3D printing is, act is actually more efficient from, in a situation like that. Now for us, one other advantage of it is you also get multi-scale manufacturing built in. So the materials that we're using, the functional materials, they're called nanomaterials. They're basically really, really small particles, almost uh, smaller than dust, basically. But they have functionality that's as good as what you might see in, in electronic computer chips. So we have these inks, as we call them, that are nanoscale inks, but then we print at a uh, micron scale, which is kind of the length scale of the diameter of your hair. And uh, that's actually a scale which works well for biology. Most biological uh, processes happen at that micron scale. But then we can build up into devices that are macro scale, meaning things that you could take photographs of, hold in your hand, and, and that sort of thing. So you have customization and you have multi-scale manufacturing all built into this one tool. And that's what we think overcomes things like the low throughput issue that, that I discussed before. So I'm going to talk about a few projects, specific projects that we worked on that address all of these issues uh, and, and we think represent some of kind of futuristic things that you could do with 3D printing. But we have a lot more ideas and we're working on some really crazy things right now. So um, now the first, the first project we worked on was this, uh, what we call a bionic ear, as you can see here. Now, uh, I'm not some old, 3D printing has actually been around from the 80s, but I'm not, uh, I'm not from that uh, generation of, of 3D printers. So all those guys who see the emergence of 3D printing now in the engineering field, they're all, um, you know, they think of us as, as whippersnappers who kind of came in late to the game. Uh, but actually, uh, I only, so I only heard about it maybe three or four years ago. I never had heard of 3D printing at all before uh, 2011. And what I, when I heard about it, it wasn't from one of these traditional guys who are printing hard plastics. It was actually someone who was using the printer to, to print food. And what he had done is he had printed a muffin, so he put flour into the uh, printer. And so he was printing a muffin uh, where if you cut the muffin in half, there would actually be a letter written in different food coloring in the muffin because you could build it up layer by layer. So it's kind of like a, like a spy decoy muffin, espionage muffin. Uh, and so, uh, so I thought, well, this is amazing. I saw this talk. I never heard of 3D printing before. I saw him do this. And I thought, maybe you could put functional materials into these machines. Maybe you can do that. So we had this idea, went immediately back to the lab, and I had a grad student, um, uh, and I said, you know, think of something where we can kind of maybe take biological materials, electronics, uh, other materials, all feed them into this printer and see if we can make something that uh, can, is a three-dimensional interweaving, as we call it, of electronics and biology. And, uh, you know, people are working on this problem. So the, there's groups out there, the, a big thing actually in electronics these days is making these electronic chips that I showed before, making them more tissue-like, and then kind of printing them or pasting them onto the skin. That's what this whole field of electronic tattoos is, is all about. And that's really interesting, uh, and they've done some amazing things with that. The only thing about that, though, is we wanted to do something a little bit different. Instead of kind of interfacing skin-like electronics onto the skin as a final step, we wanted to actually build an organ from scratch where the electronics and the organ kind of grow together in a Petri dish. Um, and uh, not in a final step, but they kind of emerge together uh, uh, in one system. Now, the way we did that, of course, is we used a 3D printer. And uh, the nice thing about this is, um, you know, in traditional tissue engineering, where people are trying to grow organs and stuff, for example, trying to make an ear, what they would do is they would they had been using a 3D printer before to do it, but what they did is they would print a hard plastic mold of an ear. And then they would take uh, artificial tissue, put it into that mold, and that's where they got the shape of the ear, and then they would culture that into real cartilage tissue. So they were using the 3D printer to make a hard plastic mold of an ear. But we thought, you know, what if you could just put the cells directly into the printer and print the ear out directly without using a mold? So there, in this case, you're relying really on the, on, the, on the drawing from the computer. And in this particular case, we bought, uh, this is our first generation 3D printer here. This only costs about $2,000. And um, it was actually good because we, we couldn't go buy one of these $100,000 machines to do this because if we did, you know, they only accept hard plastics in the machine. And only the proprietary polymers that the company lets you use, you can put in the machine. If you put weird stuff like cells and nanomaterials and uh, what we were trying to do uh, into these machines, they would jam pretty quickly. The machine would just jam, and then you completely violate your warranty because you put stuff in there you weren't supposed to. 
And so you, the, actually having a, buying one of these $2,000 machines that a high school student helped us build was actually made sense for this project. And so, um, and the irony of that, of course, is you end up with systems that are actually more sophisticated in functionality than what you can make with a $100,000 uh, machine. That's kind of the irony of the whole situation. So here's, a, here's the actual uh, ear being printed uh, directly, as you can see. If we have sound here. Um, now what's happening here is we have cells embedded within a artificial matrix being printed directly into the shape of the ear. So no more was required. This computer tells this machine to build up this ear there by there. But our ink is actually cells within an artificial matrix. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so, so these cells are called carbocyte cells. So what carbocyte actually is, is these carbocyte cells embedded within a matrix which is proteins that they excrete. So you take these cells and they excrete proteins and that's actually what carbocyte is. Very simple. Um, that's why uh, there's not very there's not much vasculature in cartilage, which is the reason why um, if you have if you damage your cartilage, it's very slow to heal because there's not that much blood flow. That makes it a simple organ to print. Although people are doing things more complicated, than that, like introducing vasculature and stuff. Which maybe we'll get to that a little bit later. Now the thing about this is when when we print, we print these chondrocyte cells within a artificial matrix. That printing process takes about an hour or two. It turns out the cells can survive the process of being loaded into the printer, being extruded out, we don't use heat. If we used heat, the cells would be killed. In our case, we, everything's done at room temperature. So they can survive that process. About 90% of the cells survive that process. Um, even delicate cells like neurons can survive that process. Now, after we print this out, we culture this in a Petri dish for 12 weeks. That's when these cells excrete their own extra extracellular matrix. The original artificial matrix dissolves away, and that's when you end up with something that is actually cartilage tissue. Now, what's interesting here is we also have this electronic coil in the ear, as you can see. And this electronic coil has cells on top of it. The coil penetrates vertically down through the ear, and it comes out through this helical-shaped electrode on the side. So it truly is, although the ear is crude and the electronics are crude, because this is our first generation uh, printer, you still have a system in which electronics is three-dimensionally interwoven throughout a biological uh, construct here a real viable cartilage tissue, real functional electronics merged together in three dimensions. That's the idea. And the green there is basically showing that the cells are healthy even right up next to the, le the electronics. Now, uh, so what's the point of this? Um, why is this a bionic ear? Well, first of all, um, if you think about how humans hear, then the way we hear is actually, uh, so as I speak to you now, there's pressure waves coming. Uh, they hit your eardrums. Uh, you have little hair cells in your ears which vibrate, and that converts a signal from mechanical, which are these pressure waves coming, hitting your ear, and then into electrical, which goes to the brain. The brain is basically an electrical processing organ. However, none of our five senses are actually electronic, direct electronic to the brain, because when we evolved, we weren't surrounded by electronic gadgets like we are now with laptops and cell phones. We just evolved in, we had colors, we had smell, we had taste and we had uh, touch and hearing, which are both mechanical. So all of these senses are designed to convert these external signals around us into electrical signals to the brain. But what if you could have a direct sixth sense that goes straight to the brain? So let me give you an example. We mentioned cochlear implants before. It's basically a wire that's fed into the cochlea. So I've met someone who, who wears these cochlear implants, and he, what he told me is he can take his cell phone, which is electronic, and plug it directly into the cochlear implant, and he can basically have a phone conversation where someone standing next to him wouldn't hear anything because he literally is a signal directly from the electronic gadget directly to the brain, in a sense. Uh, and he can hear everything just fine. Now, this is what this ear can do. It's basically bionic ear. It can also hear outside the normal range of hearing. It can hear basically up to the, the, giga, the megahertz range. So, um, I have so what you see on the screen and what you hear is actually what's bionic ear. We printed a left one and a right one. They're sitting on the table, and uh, they're listening to Beethoven. That's we tried a number. Of, they enjoyed that one the most. And so it's not just a piece of cartilage sitting on a table. It has the ability to receive sound signals and listen to music. Okay, so that was kind of our first foray. Now, again, this uh, answers many questions to us that yes, 3D printing can handle 
biological materials, electronic, it can weave them together. But also, it goes back to this issue of customization. If you wanted to make an ear for yourself, you wouldn't want to mass manufacture it. Let's say you're missing the ear. You would want to scan the other ear, get that information, flip that over, and then use that to print uh, the missing ear. So customization is key here. Now, what else can we do? So uh, in that particular case, that coil that we made was a conducting metallic uh, coil, which basically is just like an antenna, really. So an antenna is a very simple electronic device. Um, it just receives signals, basically, or it can transmit signals. But you're, it's not like what your computer can do. Your computer can process signals. And the reason for that is because the computer is based on a semiconductor, not a conductor. So most of the printing that's been done, uh, these inks, uh, silver inks, um, these liquid metal inks, they're all conductors. The, the ink in the ear, they're all conductors, but not semiconductors. You can only get zeros and ones and bits of information using semiconductor. So we thought, you know, we hadn't seen anyone actually 3D print a semiconducting device before. We had seen people 3D print breadboards, electronic breadboards, and then plug devices into them, but not create a full electronic semiconducting-based device uh, directly. So we had this idea, and um, I'm going to skip some of the details, but uh, we had this idea, can you print a semiconducting-based device? So we thought maybe we could print an LED. Uh, if you know what an LED is, it's basically uh, it's a, one of the things, uh, for example, in your uh, battery pack, you'll see the, the, the bulb light up. That's an LED. Um, it's, it's a semiconducting-based device that emits light when you apply a voltage to it. That's really what it is. And it can form the foundation for transistors, which will be demonstrated later on. And we're work that's one of the projects we're working on. Now, you can see here that we made these 3D printed LEDs here, which consisted of lots of different materials coming together. So this is when we built this second generation printer. And now we can handle things like um, soft materials, polymers, uh, inorganic materials, nanomaterials, uh, materials that are hydrophobic, materials that are hydrophilic, integrate them all together. And what you see here is actually the integration of five or six completely different materials in order to make these LEDs. And you can make them and print them onto tape, for example, and then tape them onto uh, uh, lab goggles. You can tape them onto gloves. You can tape it onto paper, and you can see there an LED that's actually being lit up on gloves and lit up on paper because we 3D printed this LED on tape and then put the tape on these various services. Now, what is the advantage of, of using a 3D printer to make uh, semiconducting devices, what would be the advantage? Uh, so Intel obviously does a great job, amazing job of making these uh, large-scale transistors, semiconducting devices on a uh, very efficiently and then carving them up into computer chips. What can you do with a 3D printing-based approach that Intel could not do? That's the question. So one of the things we thought of is that, first of all, everything Intel does, as we saw before, is done in two dimensions. It's all planar-based fabrication. It's all chips, wafers, uh, everything in a plane. What if you could, and then it's all hard, rigid materials like silicon. It's all based on silicon, Silicon Valley, right? So silicon is a hard material. It's basically like glass. You drop it, it shatters. But what if you could go and print on a non-flat, soft surface? So we thought of a contact lens. And there's lots of people like Google, for example, interested in integrating electronics onto contact lenses. But it's really hard. For the reasons that I mentioned before, it's really hard to get semiconducting materials integrated and devices onto soft, flat, uh, soft, non-flat surfaces, like, for example, a contact lens. But the 3D printer can go and do this because it's all additive. It just adds materials to a surface, OK? Now, the trick to doing this is the, the key thing that we did here is everyone has a different prescription of contact lenses, which means every contact lens is shaped slightly different from one person to the next. So what we did here is we used a little trick where we went and we scanned a contact lens. So this, this upper right image here is actually a 3D scan of a contact lens where we got the exact top topology of this contact lens. And we took that information and we fed it into the printer. And then the printer went and it printed one of these LEDs on the contact lens. But it knew how to do that in a conformal way because it knew what the, the, exactly what the contact lens looked like. So it knew how to uh, draw the conducting materials and the semiconductors on that lens and adjust its height as it printed in order to uh, account for the shape of that lens. And so what you can see here in this lower right image there is an actual contact lens, which has an actual LED lighting up on the surface of that contact lens, an orange LED that was, that was uh, 3D printed on, directly on this contact lens using this approach. So you can imagine now, um, 
you know, having a contact lens or having some, something on your eye which can emit light. Or you can also imagine making things like bionic eyes, uh, which is one of the things that we're working on too. Um, now, what else can you do with a three-dimensional printing process uh, using semiconducting materials? So you can print onto non-flat soft surfaces. <coughs> you can also print into three dimensions. So you, now you're no longer restricted to flat electronics. Now you can build up electronics into three dimensions. And actually, there's these videos that people have made on YouTube of all these cubes of LEDs uh, where the, the, the cubes, the LEDs uh, go back and forth and light up different LEDs. And most of our research projects are, are inspired by YouTube anyway. Uh, so we do a lot of work with, with cats and things like that. So here's an actual cube of LEDs where the, the electronics here, this is a physical cube, you know, uh, the electronics here are not just planar. They go up vertically and you have these, all these little thing, like LEDs lighting up in the system here. And we thought, can we build that using a 3D printer? Not maybe something as sophisticated as what you see on the left, uh, but maybe some, a smaller version of this where you have maybe eight LEDs that are multicolored, all embedded within a cube where the LEDs and the cube and everything came out of the same 3D printer. That was, that was the goal. And in fact, you know, we built that printer. My student worked really hard on this, and we were able to get it. It's not quite as pretty as in the schematic, but still, this is the first demonstration of a 3D printed semiconducting device all integrated together in three dimensions. So you can see this cube here is actually made of something called silicone. It's the same silicone used in cosmetic implants. It's a elastomeric uh, material. It's very hydrophobic though. It's actually hard to, to print on, but we found tricks to do that. So you have this silicone cube and then within that cube, which is, which that cube is 3D printed. And then within that, we 3D print the LEDs as well. And you can see as we go around and probe this cube, you can see at the top that you have these orange LEDs light up. And then at the bottom, you can actually see, see the reflection on the bottom of green and orange LEDs lighting up too. So you actually do have a multicolored LED cube system uh, all created by 3D printing. There was, no, there was no material that wasn't done by 3D printing here. So we've taken basically electronics out of Intel. You know, if you go to Intel, in order to do the, the, the electronics fabrication, they have to, they, they work in these clean rooms which are completely devoid of dust and you have to wear robes and things to protect any dust from you coming and landing on their chip. Very expensive uh, uh, systems, very expensive clean rooms. We've basically taken electronics out of Intel and put it on a simple lab bench basically and made a real semiconducting device here just using a 3D printer and integrated many different materials together in three dimensions, things that Intel couldn't do, using this $10,000 machine that just sits on a table, basically. Uh, it's pretty crazy. So now you can think of maybe taking this, you know, putting it out into the field, like with a soldier, if he needs to make something, some electronic device, you, he doesn't have to wait for Intel to process it, and then they drop it on, you know, out in the field. He can maybe, using raw materials, make the device directly for himself right out in the field. That's the idea. All right, uh, I'm just going to talk about this briefly. So now we kind of think of this as a toolbox of what 3D printing can do. We've seen it can do hard plastics. It can do uh, cells. Uh, it can do tissue. It can do uh, semiconductor materials, electronic materials. We also have this project, which, which I'll just mention briefly, but um, this involves actually printing chemical and biological materials to these capsules. So this is, uh, we call this dynamic tissue engineering. That's the idea. So the idea, basically, the big picture idea is what if you had a matrix, right, of stem cells, and it's sitting there, you have a matrix of stem cells, what if you hit that matrix with a red laser and it grows into a heart? Or what if you hit it with a green laser and it grows into a liver instead, something like that? So we kind of call this dynamic tissue engineering, where you have uh, signals and chemical events happening, uh, which you can trigger to make different outcomes uh, biologically. And this is kind of complicated to, to explain, but uh, so I'll, I'll just do kind of a more hand-waving thing. But really what this comes down to is basically introducing chemical and biological control into systems using the 3D printer. It turns out that the 3D printer is an ideal tool to do this. So we made these capsules, as we call them. It's basically core shell capsules where the capsule, the, the thing about these, these, this control is you want to have total control over the dose of material that you release and total control over the space that is located and total control over the time at which you release it. And this, the 3D printer allows all three because 
the droplet that comes out of the 3D printer is a well-defined volume of stuff. So that means you have total control over the dose of, of chemical that you release at some later time. You have total control over, the, uh, over where you put that stuff using the XYZ stage of the 3D printer. And we mount lasers onto the printer to trigger these capsules at certain times to release the stuff. And so we have total control over time there too. So I'll just show you like the, the nice little video here. So this is actually a um, artificial, uh, this is a uh, hydrogel, as it's called. And into that, we put these blue capsules that can be released at some later time. And then we can also put red capsules of some other material that can maybe be released at some other time. So you have control over what you're imprinting into this device uh, when you're releasing it, and you can uh, make lots of different materials that can be released at trigger times and trigger locations. And that's actually what's, what's shown in this figure here. If that's not totally clear to you, I'm going to give you an example of this uh, in, in the next project here. So this is kind of a, a very quick overview of this project, but the point is we have chemical and biological control. That's another tool in our tool set of 3D printing. So let's actually bring everything together into a project, which is a real-world biomedical project problem that we solved uh, using 3D printing, which couldn't be solved any other way. And uh, this was for a pro project involving regenerating nerves. So if you don't know much about the peripheral nervous system, it's actually not that difficult to understand. It's basically, I mentioned before, the brain is this electronic processing unit, and you have two-way communication between the body and the brain. So the brain can send information out to the body that controls motor function. That means, so when I'm moving my fingers here, that's because the brain is going out and telling my fingers to do that. If I go and touch something, though, that information is from my finger, which goes back to the brain. So you basically have this two-way communication system that's called sensory. So you have motor, motor control out, and then sensory information back into the brain. Um, now the thing about this is this information flow can be damaged or destroyed in some way. So you can have an accident, or uh, you can be a soldier in the field and get hurt, or you can have a uh, disease which degenerates your nerves. And what happens is these people lose motor function and or they lose sensory function. Um, and this actually affects about 200,000 people every year. So 200,000 people uh, suffer from these peripheral nerve injuries, uh, which it limit their ability to control their, their motion or limit their ability to feel things. And uh, we want to find ways of, of regenerating these nerves. How do we do that? So it's actually not that difficult to understand. If you have a nerve, let's say here, and then I make a cut in the nerve, okay? There's now two ends of the nerve. I made the cut in the nerve. That information flow is now stopped. And you have two ends of the nerve. You have the, the proximal end, which is the end still connected to the body, the distal end, which is kind of the free-floating end. Your body is smart enough to know that that's dead tissue, so it starts actually eating away that, that nerve ending. But if you want to bridge this gap and restore this nerve function, how do you do that? So the, the gold standard for doing that is something called uh, autograft, which means you take a healthy nerve from somewhere else in your body and you graft it into that gap and then you restore your nerve function. The problem with that, of course, is that you have to then sacrifice a healthy nerve somewhere else in the body to fill in that gap. So you need another surgery and you have loss of function for where you took that nerve. Uh, now, if you have a nice friend, they can give you a nerve that's called an allograft, but then you have issues with uh, immune response because it's coming from someone else. So what people have been doing is they've been trying to get around this problem by making synthetic channels in the lab that can basically bridge this gap. So they make these polymer tubes, and then you insert the two ends of the nerve into that tube, and you suture those two ends, and then you wait, and then over time, the nerve will regrow from the proximal end in it, to the distal end, and that tube will basically act as a physical barrier to basically guide the, the regrowth of that nerve. The only problem with this technique is that what if you have a cut? You know, nerves are not just always lines, right? You, nerves, if you look at them, they branch and they, uh, uh, they uh, uh, separate and they do all kinds of interesting geometries. What if you want to make something that's more complicated than just a line? And actually, if, this, if you have damage to a point, for example, where you have loss of motor and sensory function, usually what they'll do is they'll just restore the motor function because the more important you have motor control than sensing. But we'd like to basically uh, restore both. And the 3D printer is a tool that allows us to do this. So we actually went and we, uh, we looked at nerves in rats. So we, had a, we looked at a branch point where you have mixed motor and sensory, and it comes out, and then it branches into motor and branches into sensory at this branch point here. 
And so what we did is we cut that nerve out and we scanned the nerve using a 3D scanner, which is the other key tool that I mentioned before that we use in conjunction with a 3D printer is the scanner to get exactly what that nerve looks like on a computer. And then we can go feed that information into the printer and make a, a guide that's not just a linear tube, but actually can branch just like the original nerve branch and restore nerve function that's not just linear, but maybe bunches of nerves that are all branched out. So let me show you exactly what this looks like here. So these are rats. We looked at the sciatic nerve, which is a major lower, uh, major nerve in the lower part of the body. Uh, we looked at a part where you had, as the nerve travels down, you have mixed motor and sensory, then it branches off into motor, branches off into sensory, and we cut that out uh, ourselves. So the nerve loses function in its leg, and then we can take that piece of tissue, that nerve that we cut out, we could scan it and get the exact information of exactly what that nerve looks like that we cut out. And then we can take that information, put it into our 3D printer, and print out a nerve, uh, a nerve guide that is exactly shaped like the original nerve. And this is a silicone guide. Now, in, in this guide, we actually put the capsules that I showed before, as you can see there, because we can do multifunctional materials in our printer. So we can make the guide, but we can also make these capsules. And these capsules, you can see there's red ones and green ones. And the red ones are actually telling you that motor, as it regrows, that motor should go this way and sensory should go the other way. So these are actual biological cues, proteins introduced into this guide, all using the same 3D printing process that tell the, the regrowing nerve that motor should grow this way, sensory should grow the other way. Okay? That's the advantage of, of our multifunctional printer, to be able to introduce these cues into it. You can also imagine in the future maybe introducing electronics into it so you can stimulate the nerve as it regrows to, to make faster uh, nerve growth. Now, one thing that's really cool about this, um, before I show you the, the, the rat videos, is that I mentioned before, you make this cut here, the body is smart enough to know that this part, the distal end, should be eaten away because otherwise you just have dead tissue there because this, only this end is connected to the body, the other part is kind of free floating. What happens when the body does that is it leaves behind these little grooves or these channels that you can see in this image here. And what happens is the, those grooves are actually good because uh, if you ever do get nerve regrowth, those grooves act as physical guides that tell the nerve how it should regrow into those, uh, into those channels. Now, when we print the guide, as you saw there, the amazing thing about this is uh, the 3D printer is not perfect, okay? When you print something using a 3D printer, you don't get a perfectly smooth surface because we printed it line by line going this way. So if you look at it, you actually have ridges on this, uh, on this tube. Now, what's amazing about this is these ridges, which came out by accident, can actually help guide the, the direction of nerve regrowth. And as you can see in the middle image there at the bottom, if you put culture neurons in these guys, they grow right along the length of that tube because of those little uh, grooves that are built in the tube by accident from the 3D printer. So we have physical cues, we have chemical cues from the capsules, and then here's the final outcome here. So we took these, we cut out the, the nerve uh, in the rat, we implanted this guide, and then we left it there for 12 weeks. So here's our friend, the rat. So this is one day after we cut out his nerve. If you look at the lower uh, back left limb, you can see he's basically limping there where that, where that cut took place. He can walk a little bit, but actually not that, not that well uh, using that, that uh, back uh, leg there. So this is 12 weeks later after having this guide implanted in the rat. Uh, now he can walk uh, perfectly fine again. Um, the guide is still in there. It's not biodegradable at this stage, but in the future we can do biodegradable guides. Uh, but you have basically total restoration of both motor and sensory function within the rat using one of these 3D printed guides. Okay, so with that, um, if we have time, I can, I'm happy to take questions, but uh, I'd like to thank my group uh, that's working on this. This is a group here in Minnesota. Uh, our collaborators, lots of collaborators, lots of fun people working on this project. Lots of funding, and so uh, happy to answer any questions you might have, and thanks a lot for having me here. Thank you, Mike. Um, if we have uh, about five minutes for questions, so if anyone has any questions, please. Yeah, question. Just, uh, just uh, from conception to be able to create something online, I mean, is the programming really complicated or is it pretty straightforward with these printers? Or? It depends on how complicated you want to get, actually, um, and it depends on how many objects you have. 
And so um, at this stage, we kind of have it down now where we basically can just create something in a CAD program, and then we send it to a slicer, which slices it up into layers. We feed that information into the printer, which then prints the layers. Um, but depending on the complexity of that system, uh, the, both the printing and the processing can actually take quite a long time. Uh, so it really depends on many different things. It depends on the resolution, the number of objects, um, and uh, the size of the object and things like that. So it actually varies widely depending on exactly what you're, what you're trying to do. Yeah, question. Have you, what role uh, does simulation play, like computer simulations, in modeling your environment, and have you used that yet? Uh, so we did do that actually when we did the nerve guide here. Um, if, just very briefly, if you look at the, if you look at the nerve tissue here, so the, that, that lower part there is actually like very thin. So we actually did some modeling on that. It's found that if we implanted something like that in the rat, it would actually tear there. So we actually use that to, to burnish up that, that region there. Um, and other people have used modeling too to, to figure out exactly what the ideal mechanical structure would be that you would then 3D print. So you know, modeling is a key component of, of, of these sorts of things. The 3D printer is not going to tell you what the optimal geometry should look like. You have to figure that out using modeling beforehand and then put that information into the printer. Any other questions? Yeah. So you're trying to guide um, the neuro to, to connect, to reconnect. So does that mean that it grows through the inside of that pathway you created with the 3D printing? Is it going through the middle of it? Or is it, how, how is it? Yeah, see the nerves are connected. Uh, it's a hollow tube, so we put, we hollow? force the nerve. That's the, the surgeon has to do that. So these, these are actually very small. They're like a millimeter. So the surgeon has to put this soft tissue into the guide. Um, he has the hard job, yeah. Yeah, that. <laughs> so. Okay. And the, and the 3D printer, um, it's, it's, how does it create the hollow center when it's layering? How does it manage to create the proper uh, width of a... Yeah, that's, uh, it, it turns out there's some tricks involved, but you can see here, actually, this is, this is sped up, obviously, but you can see it is actually making a hollow guide as it's printing here because we just leave the center... Uh, see, you can put the, the, the capsules in the hollow part and then cover it up on the top. It's not super easy to do, but we found tricks to do that, as you can see here. So, Yeah. Excellent presentation. I was Thanks. curious, did you do some uh, radiological studies on the regrowth of the nerve, and were you able to look at it using, for say, maybe MR or CT, probably MR mostly? Uh, we didn't do anything that sophisticated, unfortunately. We, we, this, we had a very limited time. This was a small animal study. Um, so all we had was this... Uh, was this uh, histology data there? Um, however, uh, we are working on projects now where we do the inverse, which is we can take uh, CAT scans or MRI scans of organs, so we get the exact geometry of the organ and then feed that information to the printer to print something that exactly replicates the uh, structure of a complex organ. Okay, any other questions? So, what's the legal status of this for your team in terms of protection or not? Yeah, well, we've definitely sent these things out for, for patent protection, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> now, the question that always comes up, though, when we do that, because I know nothing about this, so the question always comes up, are we patenting the printer that we built, or are we patenting the process, or are we patenting the device that we make in the end? And also, you can think of that from a commercial perspective, too. Are you going to make money from making the printer? Are you going to make it from selling software? Are you going to make it from... Selling the device? I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure exactly the answer to any of these questions, to be honest to you. So I wish I could be here for the rest of the day to find out. But. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, thanks a lot. Yeah. I think that's a great segue into um, our next panel. Um, talking about patent issues and intellectual property issues. Uh, but before that, we're going to just, just take a short break uh, for 10 minutes. Um, there's more bagels and coffee outside, so you guys can take more food if you want. Um, but if you can just get back by 10 o'clock, that'll be great. Thank you. <laughs>